Sermon on the Mount ends very interestingly with a specific review of the sermon. A sermon review in and of itself is not particularly noteworthy. They happen all the time, but most often they are informal. On the ride home from church or at lunch afterwards, what would you think about the sermon? It was awesome. Excellent. What a word. What a powerful word. Or I don't know. It's kind of hard to follow today. I'm not sure what he or she was really trying to get at. Or I'm not sure what the message had to do with the text. It seemed like quite a stretch to me. Or boy, did I have a tough time staying awake today. I know none of you have ever said things like that. I have. Not when I was preaching, however. But this was a formal review. The Army uh, lives and breathes formal reviews. They're called AARs, one of those great acronyms, after action reviews. We live and die on those things. The formal process by which we review and evaluate almost everything we do. What went well, what didn't, what should be sustained or what should not, what should be improved or added. Matthew gives us not an AAR, but an ASR, an after sermon report or review of what Jesus had just preached. A formal statement about the reaction and response of Jesus' hearers to Jesus' message. I take this to be a collective response. That is the overwhelming consensus of those who heard him that day and that their response was consensual enough and significant enough and clearly articulated enough that it needed to be accurately reported. And Matthew does. In those relatively brief words, Matthew notes three important significant, I'm sorry, two important significant aspects of their response, specifically how it impacted them and specifically why. First, how they were impacted in a single word. Verse 28, they were amazed. They were amazed. Let me say something briefly about the crowds because if you were here for the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew seems to indicate that Jesus went up the mountainside in order to get away from the crowds in order to be able to devote himself to his most ardent and closest disciples. And that's exactly what he did. But as was often the case, their solitude was short-lived. Because the crowds would come looking for him and usually didn't stop until they had found him. So it is not difficult to imagine him going up to the hillside with his closest disciples to teach them and the crowds making their way, finding where they were at, and coming and straggling in. And by the time the sermon was over, there were crowds that were there. Those crowds, we're told, were amazed. That word that Matthew uses is actually a stronger word than even that. It means literally to strike out of one's senses. That's the literal translation, lexicon. It carries the sense or the meaning of astonishment or even shock. The NRSV says they were astounded by his teaching. And not to bore you with grammar, but it is in the imperfect tense of the verb, meaning that it was ongoing or a lingering effect. That is, that it impacted them. They were not only astonished, they were deeply moved and deeply impacted. That's what Matthew is relaying. By what? By his sermon. By his preaching. 
by his spoken word. Not by some astounding miracle, like the man they brought to Jesus who was deaf and unable to speak all of his life, that all of them who were there knew and had known for most of their lives, whom Jesus suddenly healed and instantly he could hear and instantly he could speak with utter clarity, though he'd never heard all of his life. Mark says those who witnessed it were astounded beyond measure. Same word used here. Or the young boy that was brought to Jesus completely debilitated by constant seizures, over whom a demonic spirit held sway, and Jesus rebuked the spirit and healed him instantly, completely. And Luke tells us that all that were there were astounded, same word, by the greatness of God. Matthew says that was the same response to his words, to his message. In fact, throughout the gospel, Matthew, of the four gospels, will only use this particular word in reference to the response to Jesus' spoken word. His preaching and teaching. When he preached in the synagogue of his hometown at Nazareth, the congregation, uh, we're told by Matthew, was astounded by what he said. Same word. In response to the recorded teaching in Matthew chapter 22, in that lengthy chapter, he says, the crowd was astounded at his teaching. Not the response that we usually associate with preaching, is it, if we're honest? Not what we would attach to the spoken word, astounded. Some great miracle, yeah. Some great act of God, sure. Some great movement of the spirit demonstrated by the dramatic, emotional, outward, overt response of a large group of people. This happened in times of revival, great awakening, astounding. But notice Matthew does not tell us that they were astounded by the people's reaction or response to the sermon. They were astounded by the sermon itself. The crowds were amazed at his teaching, the spoken word. Which, by the way, reminds us that Jesus never wrote a book. Closest he came to ever writing anything down was on that scene with the woman caught in adultery when he knelt down and the, you know, furious, ferocious crowd ready to deal with her and wrote in the dirt, of which we have no idea what he wrote. Everything he did was spoken. Recorded later by others, But in his life, it was the spoken word. Which begs the question, why? Why were they so taken? So astounded? So deeply impacted? Was it his looks, his personality? Was it some kind of unusual charisma, giftedness? Was it his voice, his delivery? Was it some kind of special ability or giftedness in speech? Was he humorous and entertaining, capable of wowing a crowd, good stand-up? Did he possess some kind of special magnetism, spellbinding power or ability? What was it? Well, it is significant that virtually nothing is recorded in the Gospels about either Jesus' appearance or his personal manner 
or his personal characteristics. Isn't that interesting? Virtually nothing. Which strongly suggests that there was nothing unusual or noteworthy about any of them. Either his personal appearance, his personality, or his personal characteristics. Nothing that would draw particular enough or special enough attention to be noteworthy and recorded. Isn't that interesting? That what Isaiah the prophet described long before his coming was entirely true and accurate. These words, Isaiah 52, 2 of the Messiah, of our Jesus. Listen to them. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Isn't that interesting? None of the things that we naturally assume being essential to draw people. None of the things that we would naturally assume to be the reason or cause for that. Which far from explaining the impacts of his words only adds to the question of it. How? Why? Well, Matthew's review records specifically why. Verse 29. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. He taught as one who had authority. What were they describing? What did they mean by that? Well, the word he uses, <laughs> forgive me for this, the word he uses in the Greek is the word exousia. That might be a familiar word to you if you have studied or used commentaries in the Gospels or the New Testament. You may have heard the word. It's a very important word in the New Testament. It means both authority and power. It's really not accurately translated by one or the other. It could be translated accurately power, but it has but there's another generic word for power that would be better used if that's all you wanted to say. It can be translated authority accurately, but it really means both. Authority and power. It means both having the authority to do something and the power or ability to do it. For instance, a police officer has both the authority and the power to arrest you. His authority to arrest you would mean nothing if he didn't have the corresponding power. But he can put you in handcuffs and he can put you in the back of his car and he can take you down and put you in a cell. He has that power. Power over your life, doesn't he? A judge has both the authority and the power to sentence you to that jail. He can write a sentence, put his signature on it, and there it is. He has both the authority and the, and the power to fulfill or accomplish what authority he's been given. That sense of the word is most clear when the word is used, as it is a number of times, in the book of Revelation. Let me just give you a few examples, and I'll just read them for you briefly. Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. I looked there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a quarter of the earth, to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beast of the earth. Exousia, that word. Revelation 9, 3. 
And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth, given the authority and given the power to do what they did or would do. Verse 10 of chapter 9, they had tails with stings like scorpions and their tails, they had power to torment people for five months. Exousia. 9.19 The power of the horses, there were horses and riders he saw in his vision, breastplates, etc. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes having heads with which they could inflict injury. The power of the horses, exousia. They had both the authority and the power to do what they were given authority to do. When Jesus says in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me, the word is exousia. All authority, all power. That he is given to exercise. They weren't simply saying that he spoke in a convincing way. That's not what they were saying. Or an authoritative way. Or he spoke as if he really knew what he was saying. It was much more than that. What they were saying is that when he spoke, something happened. Something happened to them. It was more than just the transfer of data or information. It was more than just the communication of facts. Something happened in that interchange. That is underscored by the specific and deliberate contrast which they made. Because he taught them as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Isn't that interesting? That they would make that deliberate contrast? He taught us as one who had exousia. Not as our teachers of the law. You know, that crowd, those crowds that were gathered were not novices when it came to sermons. To the spoken word. They had heard hundreds, if not thousands, of sermons in their lifetime, part of their life and tradition. And few, if any of those sermons, were in any way life-giving. The Pharisees were pretty dry, pretty dead. That's clear in the accounts. They'd put you right to sleep. They'd send you home feeling worse than when you came. That's discouraging, isn't it? But you know, they were good Jews, good Jewish families. It was part of the culture. It was part of convention. It was part of their obligation and duty. And so every Sabbath they were there as their teachers of the law. Blah, 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 blah. Tried to make the best of it, get what they could possibly get out of it. My, my parents were of the opinion, it, it's, it's a good truth lesson, they were of the opinion that it is easier to go to church every Sunday than to decide which Sundays you're going to go on. And so they just told us as young boys, from the time that they came to faith in Christ, we go every week. So don't get up and say, Mom and Dad, are we going this week? It's easier to just go every Sunday than to choose the Sundays you're going to go. That was their, their philosophy. So by the time I left home, I would estimate that I'd heard well over 500 sermons. And most of them not very good. Because we were, you know, we were a, a, a church in a very small little rural mountain town of about 1,500 
people. And we got two kinds of preachers, string of preachers. Young ones that were on their way to somewhere else. This was their first charge. Just to be there long enough to get a better assignment somewhere else. Or they'd already made their rounds and, were, and had not done very well, and this was their last chance. We got one of those. Not a, a formula for getting particularly great preaching, I assure you. But like these, we made the best of it. Got what we could get out of it. And studied on our own. Samuel Rutherford, the great Scottish pastor, has a great line. He's, he's famous for his letters, and those letters have been put into books and published because he carried on such a, a pastoral ministry through his letter writing. But somebody wrote to him about the fact that they had nowhere to go within any uh, reachable distance from their home to have adequate preaching. Rutherford wrote back and he said, you know, it would be really, really beneficial and wonderful if every parish had somebody who would speak and proclaim his word. But then he said this, but if not, he said, you'll have to run your pipe directly to the fountain, he said. That's what we did. That was something of the experience of these crowds. What a contrast to that Jesus was. Astonished. At what? What he said. What he spoke. When he spoke, something happened. Something happened to them personally, individually. And they were deeply affected by it, changed by it. That's why they were astonished. It wasn't simply the content, as compelling as that clearly was. It wasn't something more than just, it was something more than just that. It was part of it, but not all. I think Jesus had a wonderful ability to be able to turn our eyes into ears, give pictures, to communicate truth. I'm not in any way ignoring that, but it was not... It was not just that. It wasn't cute or clever. It wasn't funny or entertaining. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with humor. Humor is a great gift to us. But that's not what it's all about, is it? The answer to dry and dead is not funny and entertaining. It's power, exousia. That's the answer. God was speaking. God was speaking. And when God speaks, something happens. I think we often and easily forget the power of God's spoken word. Through which all of creation came into existence. By how? And God said, let there be light. And there was light. He spoke the universe into existence. His spoken word. He spoke a nation, a people into existence through a couple so old that their bodies were as good as dead. To a young virgin, he said, you will conceive and you will give birth to a son, to which her response was, may it be to me according to your word. Jesus said to the demons, go, and they fled. He said to a lame man, rise up and pick up your bed, and he rose up and picked up his bed. 
He said to a man four days dead in his tomb and buried, Come forth, and the dead man hears and comes forth. When God speaks, things happen. For the word of God is alive and and active, the writer of the Hebrews says. Alive and active. That was the difference. That's why they were astonished. God was speaking, and something was happening. Exousia. The Jewish leaders uh, sent the temple guards on one occasion to haul Jesus in, and they returned to them without him, and their leaders were none too happy about that, because they'd obviously been gone for a while. And this was their response to the question, why didn't you bring him back? No one ever spoke like this man does, they said. Let me try to bring this sermon to a conclusion before I lose you. God still speaks through what he has spoken. Do you believe that? God still speaks through what he has spoken. His primary means of doing that is the spoken word. His primary means. That has not changed. When he speaks, things happen. It is more than just the transfer of information or facts. Things that are not come to be when he speaks. When he speaks, it is more than a sermon. It is more than just a sermon. It is God speaking to his people. Or it should be. P.T. Forsyth wrote... A true sermon, he said, is a real deed. The goal of all preaching and teaching, whatever, wherever we do it, is that God speaks. Let me uh, cite two of my heroes, John R. W. Stott. These are his words. The most privileged and moving experience a preacher can ever have is when in the middle of a sermon, a strange hush descends upon the congregation. The sleepers have woken up, the coffers have stopped coughing, and the fidgeters are sitting still. No eyes or minds are wandering. Everybody is attending, though not to the preacher. For the preacher is forgotten, and the people are face to face with the living God, listening to his still, small voice. Billy Graham, in his own words, I have often felt, he said, like a spectator, standing on the side, watching God at work, I have felt detached from it with just an overwhelming sense that I wanted to get out of the way as much as I could and let the Holy Spirit take over. When, through what? The spoken word. It's not about whether you have a pulpit or not, whether it's a cocktail table with a TED Talk screen, it's not what it's about. What really matters is God speaking. 
And when it's all said and done, has he spoken? Ray Stedman used to say the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, he said. That's why we gather. That's what we pray for, work for, labor for. Whatever our context, BSF leader, BSF teacher, Sunday school teacher, preacher. That when we open up the scriptures, that somehow, some way, through our frailty, and that's what Paul was deeply aware of, wasn't he? <laughs> that all of that would be done through, tre- through, through, through this treasure communicated through these fragile jars of clay. The fragility of our mere humanity. He never could get over the fact of that. But that through that, God would speak. And his children would hear his voice. James Dane, one of my professors in seminary. It is this word, evocative, dynamic, creative, saving, sin annulling, death defeating, healing, life giving, which the church proclaims. God help us to do that and nothing less. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Just bow your heads for just a moment with me. Whatever happened that day on that hillside, one thing we know is that there were no accruements. None. It was the living Lord of glory with his people, the sheep of his pasture, and the voice of the shepherd speaking to them. That's all. But in their speaking, something happened, profound, and they were changed. Changed. And I would suggest to you that that's what I need and it's what you need as well, more than anything else. The greatest judgment that God could send upon his people was a, a famine. Not a, not a physical famine of food, but a famine of hearing the word of God. It was the greatest judgment that could come. And for 400 years they went without hearing his word spoken until God spoke his incarnate son into our lives. And he spoke to these people. It is what we need more than anything else. It's what we will labor for and work for and give ourselves to for as long as he gives us strength and means. I pray you share that conviction and commitment with me. That's worth keeping on for. It really is. Father, I thank you for these dearest brothers and sisters, for their faithfulness, tenacity, their commitment. We are a bit um, uncertain about this juncture, and we rest in you with it, committed to you however and in whatever way you would choose to use us, we surrender ourselves anew again today. That in our fellowship and in our friendships and in our corporate life, that somehow in some way that you would pour out your spirit 
upon us. And that you would open up doors for that word to go forth. That you would make us, each of us, channels for that voice to go forth. And then you would open the way to hungry hearts to hear it, we pray. For that we are absolutely, utterly dependent upon you. Help us, we pray. We thank you that as we uh, come to your table this morning, we come in all of our frail humanness to ask that you would take us just as you took that loaf of bread and gave thanks and broke it and blessed it and then broke it and then gave it, that you take our lives, what they are, bless them, break them and give them, we pray. Meet us here and bless us here, we pray. Living word. If you're a believer in Christ, it's his invitation, not mine or ours, to come to this table. If you're walking in fellowship with him. If not, this is the place to come. This is the place to renew that relationship. And to come to his table to renew your fellowship with him. And I invite you to do that. The Lord bless you as you do and meet you as you do in Jesus' name.